think that's what's happening with the economy. We're going to propose a trillion dollar bailout. Where's that money going to come from? We're going to tax people. Well, who are you going to tax? And how are you going to tax them? And people are already taxed. And the people you're going to tax um, are the rich. Well, there aren't that many rich people there. And many of the rich people who uh, thought they were rich aren't rich. You know, it's interesting about the, the Madoff uh, case that sort of is um, dominating the news, and I don't represent him, and so many people have come to me with, you know, can you sue him, can we sue him, would you like to sue him? And I said to them, this is, you know, I, don't get, I don't think you get it. There's nothing there. At the end of the day, there's going to be like $40, and there's going to be like 10, 10 million people who are going to want to split $40. So if you have uh, $800 million in there, in four years, you're going to get a check for a dollar and a half. That's what's going to happen. I'm exaggerating, but I'm not. That's what's going to happen. So he said, well, if I invested $50,000 20 years ago, and I get statements every month that show that I have $11 million, and now I know I have nothing. So I only really lost $50,000. That's the truth. That's the math. But you lost $11 million because you're now in your 60s, you're getting ready to retire, you're, you're borrowing against it, or you've been getting cash withdrawals every month as your dividend, if you will, and you've been living on that. And then suddenly it's gone. So you're, you're not looking at $50,000 that you lost. You're looking at your entire net worth and your entire wealth, and you have fixed overhead of $100,000 a month that you can no longer meet and you have another, no other cash resources. Now, I feel sorry for a lot of the people who got involved in that. I feel very bad for the charities that got involved. I think the people who are trustees of these organizations have a lot of explaining to do. I think there are intermediaries who will ultimately either get prosecuted or sued, and there's gonna be no one left with anything who had any involvement in it. But I've been a criminal lawyer for 35 years. You put me in a room with a Madoff type person, and I've represented 50 Ponzi uh, scheme people in the course of my lifetime. I've prosecuted them when I was a prosecutor. In an hour, in an hour, you could basically figure out that there's something wrong. Okay, if I come to you and I say, here's the deal, you give me an investment, every month you're going to get 11%. <laughs> I look at you and I say, how? I said, I can't tell you. I have a system and it's going to work. And you're going to get 11% every month. And the reason I don't feel sorry for a lot of the people is because there is a greed factor that sort of fuels this interest, this fascination. Because at the end of the day, I've learned a long time ago, something is too good to be true. Exactly. It's not. Exactly. It's not. So when you, know, when you go through a volatile economy where you know the best investment houses in the country can give you a magic year where you'll get an enormous return. Maybe they'll you know, be lucky, maybe they'll pick right, or maybe there's a consistent return that they're able to present. But no one can give you a consistent return every month that's the same, because it's impossible to do that, because no one can predict the market forces with such a degree of certainty. I can tell you, uh, this is our history of you know, the last 40 years, our average return has been 22% or 8% or 3% or 15%. But then when you look, there are years when it was 30%, the years when it was 2%, the years when it was a negative return. But nobody can say, you're going to get 11% every month. And if you start to probe and you start to ask the questions, it, begin, it begins to unravel. So there is a Houdini-like, secretive, you know, um, sociopathic personality that is very good in order to do this, you have to be very, very good, but you also have to have a willing, vulnerable, interested person who, like, doesn't want to know, just wants to be on the inside. And that's what's interesting. You know, there are people who, for years, hated Bernie Madoff because he wouldn't let them in. And these people were not let in primarily because they were too inquisitive, they were a pain in the ass, they wanted to know, they questioned, and you don't have that. I have a client now whose name has not surfaced. Young kid. He started a currency trading company. And he came to me. And he said, I have a big problem and I want you to help me and this is the problem. That I created a currency trading company and I have uh, you know, 35 clients and I'm in a whole $50 million and um, it's all fraud. I said, how did you start? He said, um, I got a laptop and a printer at Staples 
and I made a lot of cold calls to European investors who I found out was sitting cash rich, and I got one guy, and I started doing three trades a month that were completely fictitious, and I would print a statement, um, and it would go out every month, and it would say, you know, you started with 50000 we did these three trades, you made $1,100, this is your new balance. And suddenly that person told his friend, and they told other people, and he has, you know, a lot of people who, and he has no office, he's never met a single client, nobody ever checked him out, he has no resume, when you go on his website, it says nothing. And what was interesting is from the day this place was taken down, and from the day we went into the United States Attorney's Office, until it was closed down completely and the website taken down, he received an additional $3 million unsolicited of people who were tripping over themselves to trying to get in to a fund run by a 35-year-old guy in jeans and a t-shirt who no one had ever met. I said, what would happen if a client said, I'd like to meet you? He would say, I, you know, I would tell him, look, you know, I'm busy, I'm traveling, I'm in Europe, I'm in France, I'm in Asia, I'm here, I'm in Canada, I, I can't. And eventually people would give up, but they kept sending him money. And I'm sitting there, I'm listening to this, and I, what I want to say is, all of these people deserve what happened to them, because this is done. But you can't say that, because do they deserve what happened to them? I, I don't think so. Is it trust? I don't think it's trust. Trust is if I know you for a long time, I trust you, you're a good faith try, and you screw up. I have an investment advisor who lost me a fortune in the last two years, but he's done it honestly. So. <laughs> sure. honestly. And he says, you know, he's tried his best, he's screwed up, you know. He had some ideas which sounded good at the time, they sounded good to me. I'm a pretty sophisticated guy. I said, okay, turn into a disaster. Did he know Lehman Brothers was going to collapse? Did he know that, you know, Merrill Lynch was going to go from 95? to 16. I mean, you know, I have a friend who's a, you know, a heavy-duty guy at Merrill Lynch for the last 35 years. He's been taking 60% of his compensation in Merrill Lynch stock. So he went from having a net worth of $30 million an hour ago. Suddenly, you know, he's got like $400. Um, what did he do wrong? I don't think he did anything wrong. And, and that's the point. I'm a, I'm a criminal lawyer. People come to me who've essentially violated the law, some intentionally, some by accident. But more and more what I am seeing is these are um, people who are being blamed. These are large <coughs> banks, large brokerage houses who have some explaining. <coughs> so they got to pick a couple of people who they've got to sacrifice. They've got to throw people overboard so that they can tell our compliance people looked at this and they found that these two people were responsible because you know they didn't do sufficient due diligence or they sent people uh, incorrect information. And that was the cause of the problem. It, it's absolute nonsense. The problem is, years ago you could take that case to trial and you could convince 12 people that there was a reasonable doubt that these people intended to defraud. Now, you're picking jurors who, when they're being questioned by a judge, can you be fair? Fair? That's the guy who caused me to go from being worth $400,000 in my 401k to not having a 401k. He says, well, that's not the guy. He, you know, you work for the city. Your city pension money was invested, you know, by another company. I don't care. It's, it's him. You know, it, it's him. This is, a, this is like a, a person who has nothing to do with the average citizen losing money. But that's, that's the mindset. So it's not a good time to get in trouble. It's not a good time to create trouble. And, and one of the things I just want to touch upon, I think most of this, when, and I want to put some meat on the bones of what you read about that very few people, really understand. There is this crisis that I think has developed as a result of banks um, essentially becoming involved in subprime mortgages and then uh, packaging those and the ultimately the market and the real estate fell and suddenly, and it's really quite simple, it sounds so complicated. If I go to a bank and my house is worth $500,000 and the bank gives me a $350,000 mortgage and I buy the house, um, and then the market crashes, and my house is worth $200,000 or $300,000, um, and I lose my job, and I can't pay my loan. That happens. That's normal. That's normal. At the end of the day, maybe the bank forecloses, maybe they rework the loan, <clears throat> maybe you get another job, maybe they extend the payments longer, maybe they waive some interest. It, that's manageable. That's business as usual. What was not business as usual is that for about 10 years, there were bundlers, there were packages, there were mortgage brokers, there were groups of people who were getting loans for people who didn't qualify from the start for the mortgages that they got. 